Hi. We're getting around to see uh, Hewlett Packard's labs, right? HP's labs now. It's not really Hewlett Packard. Well, no, it's, it's HP labs, exactly. And so we figured if you're seeing the labs, we're going to get you down into the lab and who are where you? we make things atom by atom. Okay. So I'm, I'm Phil Kikas, and I'm, I'm a computer architect. And normally, they never let computer architects in where, you know, this equipment is for the physics. What is this, first of all? So this is a scanning tunneling microscope. Yeah. It's a device with vacuum inside it, higher than that in outer space, in which we can see individual atoms. And furthermore, we can create new materials, kind of atom by atom. Yeah. And why do that? Why, why is HP do, trying to do that? The reason HP is trying to do that, uh, I'll go back to a conversation I had probably in 96, when, yeah. when a friend of mine at MIT pointed out that if Moore's law kept going for a few more years, we would shrink to the size of atoms. Yes. So and Moore's law is the, the, the number of transistors, the number of transistors going up and up and up because they go smaller and smaller. Okay, and so the question is, as you get to the size of atoms, being well aware of that, because that's what's given us this whole electronic world, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. And the real problem is the physics changes when you get to the size of atoms. Yeah. The classical physics isn't there, we've got to use quantum mechanics. So I'm in a lab called Information and Quantum Systems Laboratory. And we're trying to use the basic laws of physics to reinvent computing. Give me an, a, an example of what's different at that scale than in our, in our scale that we can perceive here. So the biggest single thing that's different is that electrons and, quite frankly, light, photons, can be both waves and particles. And while a particle electron, which is a good approximation, can't go through a wall, an electron can tunnel through empty space as a wave. And in fact, that's how this microscope works. It actually has electrons going through empty space. Now, if you're building silicon transistors, that's terrible. Because it means that as we get them smaller and smaller, the electrons can tunnel across an off transistor, and you can never turn it off. And so these things leak power like crazy. Yeah. So how do you solve that? So what we're doing is we're taking advantage of something we discovered called memristance. The fact that, you know, classically there are resistors and capacitors and inductors, and in fact, just like transistors, you build them in the factory and what you get is what you made. With memristance, it turns out that based on the history of the voltage or the current going through it, its properties start to change over time. Okay. And so we can change them deliberately. So, for example, I can take a little bit of memristive material between two nanowires okay. and I can turn it from a conductor to an insulator. That's from a one to a zero. And it won't go back when I take the power away. Interesting. So it's more than interesting. It's a cure for frustration. Yeah. Okay. How did you because guys dis discover that? And uh, you discovered it in that room right over there. Right? Well, we, we took the measurements in the room over there, and basically we discovered it by working really hard to make stuff at the atomic scale, and then carefully measuring the properties. And and because of you know we got as well as computer architects, chemists, we got good theoretical physicists here, and they said, hey, quantum mechanics predict this. Can you guys really see it? And one of the things that was really unpredicted, except for a long time ago, that there was this memristance, uh, is what would the mechanism be to change the properties? Yeah. And the mechanism is we're literally at the atomic scale. When you're only a nanometer apart, okay, that's somewhere between three and 10 atoms. Yep. The electric fields are strong enough to start to move individual atoms. Uh. And when you move the atom, it's like rebuilding the electronic device, yeah. literally changing it. So for example, now that we're at the atomic scale, we can build incredibly dense memories that when you reboot your computer, because they're non-volatile, won't go away, okay? You won't have to reboot. Reboot will be instant. Wow. 
So that's good news for yeah. your laptop. It's frankly even better news for giant servers. Yeah. Because giant servers with all their memory around, all their DRAM, dump a lot of power and money into running the DRAM. Yeah. Your, your, your DRAM roughly a thousandth of a second goes away. Yeah. Okay. This stuff, you'd write it once, so you're not constantly reading and writing, reading and writing, all of which takes power. So, you know, power in portable devices the size of the battery, yep. power in big data centers, you know, the amount of computation you can do in a fixed space yep. is the ultimate limit. How, now, how, how manufacturable, manufacturable are these memory sisters? Because I, I know this Absolutely. telescope probably is working at absolute zero or close to. No, it's not. No, oh, the, the good sorry. news is it's a high vacuum. Okay. But you're not operating at cold temperatures. But we don't. We have, for the past decade or so, stayed away from things that have to be low temperature. Yeah. Okay. I, I tend to tell people, hey, most of HP's customers don't live in liquid helium. Yeah. So we have looked for physics very deliberately, which is going to continue to work at room temperature and which is going to be completely compatible yeah. with IC fabs. We don't want to use something that won't be able to work with existing integrated circuits. And it, for people who don't know, it, that's a tough challenge because things uh, move around, uh, atoms vibrate, right? Atoms vibrate, atoms move, and so the tough challenge, and the one that's really a research question, right, is we've got to be able to move the, these atoms when we want but not move them when we don't want. Right. And so that takes a lot of experimentation, which is why you know, you've got a real experimental facility here. Yeah. How many hours went into finding the memory sister I mean, I, on this machine? I, well, it was know. on this machine and many other machines yeah. you know, that we looked at. Uh, but you know, we have been looking at those materials for a number of years, okay, of different switching materials. Yeah. And finally, we did the few key experiments over the past year that convinced us that we had memristics. But you see, that's only half the story of what we're working on. So if I gave you a bucket of a billion transistors, yep. what would you do with them? Not wired up, right? So the memristor, the device, is not the story, right? Everybody right. says, hey, there's the internet, it's connectivity. Yep. Anybody watching this on TV, okay, on the internet, most of the distance the signals went is in fiber optics. Yeah. And then in the very end, you know, they get into their house, it's electronic in the computer. And it was electronic when it went through, you know, the, the servers, the switching centers, etc. And the reason the long distance is all photonics is because it's dramatically energetically efficient. Yeah. Much easier to send photons through glass than to try to charge and discharge copper wire. Yeah. Copper wire takes away a little electricity each foot. Well, it does two things. Right? Number one, it's got resistance and it takes it away. And number two, when you turn it on and then turn it off, you've got a capacitor charging up and then charging down. And that all consumes energy. So we are also making a huge push in our laboratory, not just to do the devices, but to do the wires, yeah. to take metal wires and replace them with light. Now, the big problem has been, and, and by the way, the reason, you know, that for cables, right, you see all kinds of cables, uh, if you build something out of cables, you've got to connect them up individually. Yeah. And of course, the integrated circuit is all about not doing that. Yeah. You, you, you print them, right, it's yeah. lithography, okay? We are inventing methods to apply Moore's Law to photonics. Can you in put a little step, laser in, in at that scale? Well, the answer is you can put a laser in, but, but I ask you, when you look at your laptop, okay, does it have a, a generator and a diesel generator attached? The answer is no. no, okay? So we have plans where the power comes from a laser and then we distribute it optically and we modulate it, right? So there's no reason that every chip needs a laser. What the chips need and what we need going from board to board, right, is the ability to modulate, to turn the light on and off, yeah. and to detect it at scales which are the same as today's transistors. So if I look at the uh, DLP uh, chip that's inside the HDTV projectors right. that lots of people have in their home, right. those are millions of little mirrors They're that little are flipping mirrors. back and forth, right. right? 
Is that and what you're going to do? Is put a little, where, where a bunch of little mirrors? Where, to no, the problem <laughs> is those mirrors, right, are much bigger than wavelength of light. Yeah. And when you look at the wires in your chip, right, if you pop the lid off, okay, they're much smaller than the wavelength. So how do we do it? How do you? And, do? The, and the answer <laughs> is with techniques like nano imprint lithography, we can actually make waveguides which will be roughly the size of wavelength of light. Now the problem is that's not good enough because it turns out modern chips, right, the electrical wires are in fact much narrower. And so where I had one optical waveguide, I might have 30 or 40 metal wires. So how do I win that back? Other than power, it clearly it's more power caught and hungry. And the answer is light comes in different colors, different frequencies. Yeah. And while I can't send different electrical signals at the same time down one metal wire, I can send them down one piece of glass, basically. So using different okay. colors. Using different colors. Do you have infinite ability to... to well, it's put, not infinite, but we're talking about, you know, dozens, hundreds, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the problem is, of course, you can't build a prism to split them off. That's way too big. Yeah. We have to build a filter, okay, that tunes very finely, and it has to be not much bigger, right, than a few microns big. Wow. And so what we end up doing for that highly resonant filter is we build ourselves a racetrack, okay, and the light goes round and round it, and, you know, if, if the time to go around exactly matches the frequency of the light, the wavelength, it resonates. It stays there. And so rather than bounce light between mirrors to keep it there for a while and to build up its strength, because mirrors absorb too much, we literally trap it in a ring, which we make in not this laboratory, but one at the other end, the other side of the clean room. We trap it so that for over 10,000 times, it goes round and round. And as wow. it does so, it builds is up strength. Is that like a piece of glass then? It is a, a piece of, of, of silicon usually, or quartz. Okay, so we use we love to use silicon as a material. Yeah, because right? it's cheap. It's inexpensive and it's totally compatible, right? Mm -hmm. Even though we're using quantum physics, we want to make this stuff real. And so it's got to be compatible with, you know, the chips of today, right? Mm -hmm. And the chips of tomorrow. How did so, you guys discover that? Well, I mean, HP Labs is, is an unusual place, right? Uh, we talk to... Lots of people, when we, we, we have people who go and give lectures at universities as well, right? So we're in contact with the latest research. We're doing some of it ourselves. On the other hand, we talk among ourselves a lot. I mean, you'll find individual departments at universities very often will never talk to another department. So, you know, we've got physicists and chemists and electrical engineers and computer programmers all talking to each other. And then again, we really talk to the really good engineers in the, in the bulk of the company inventing new products to say, what are your real problems? Yeah. So there's a lot of talking yeah. back and forth. And so how many years is it gonna be before we see a chip with that kind of technology that you just described? So for the- In, a, in our own laptop or our own phone or whatever. thing, we are looking on a relatively short time scale. And we're looking for under, under a decade to get that in. Okay. Let me tell you why you'd care about that. Okay, if we can do it, and if we could push that technology eight or 10 years from now into every server, okay, the world would save 21 gigawatts. Per year. Yeah, no, giga, gigawatts is like your, your meter, it's not yeah. per year. It's just, that's equivalent to 21 nuclear power plants we never have to build, wow. or 21 giant coal-fired plants that the world never has to build. And, and by the way, we're going to have to do it because that savings, if you actually took that power and tried to do it with copper, you'd melt the chip. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, the laws of physics, if we keep doing what we're doing, are going to stop us. Okay. But those are kind of classical physics. You know, let's look at quantum mechanics. Let's look at the basic laws of physics, you know, at a level that we can see individual atoms and find another way to do it. When you joined HP uh, 17 years ago, you said? Oh, 17 years ago, yeah. Did you have any clue you would be doing this kind of work? Well, I'll tell you, as soon as I got here, I liked it. Okay, so, so the answer is no. I've worked on many things. I didn't know I'd be doing this. But this is a place where as you look around, you see people doing all kinds of interesting things. Um, we didn't know till we discovered it that we would discover a Had no idea, okay? 
Having discovered it, it turns out it has some very strange properties that as well as changing hardware may change the way we think about software. How so? That's one of the furthest out there. Rather than open source software, we want to steal from biology. And they're steal from the way brains work, not digital computers. Yeah. It turns out when you look at the equations that govern a memristor, they look an awful lot like those that govern a synapse in the brain. And so we think we're going to be able to build electronic synapses and essentially then learn from biology. You know, I mean, DARPA with the grand challenge, right, yeah. worked really hard to make cars drive. Yeah. But you watch a bunch of squirrels running around, they don't bang into each other. Yeah. Right? They can navigate. If we could do what biology does, not like the pharma companies who are stealing the chemistry, but there's several hundred million years of algorithm development yeah. by evolution, and if we can make so the synapses work, working with you? so we are working with people at Boston University, for example, as well. So this is a very broadly based activity yeah. and you know we're essentially very willing with a vision of why we'd care about it you know to follow where the research goes very cool well it's been a real honor to okay, spend great. some time with you and I've enjoyed it i hope you uh do figure out how to make some of these chips and put them yeah in we'll computers. see we'll, we'll um, so stay tuned we'll, we'll see